You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast, and I have Anthony B. Miller. We're going to be discussing the impact of nutrition, uh, radiation, you know, both ionizing and electrical and magnetic fields uh, on cancer, and also your job as well. So, Anthony, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, tell me what's what's a little bit a bit uh, about your background. How did you uh, decide to uh, you know work on the factors that may affect cancer? Well, I was um, uh, I qualified as a physician in the UK uh, in 1955. I did my normal house jobs and work in hospital, and then I went to the British Medical Research Council. Did research mainly on tuberculosis, but also uh, research and the treatment of lung cancer. And I began to realize that uh, treatment of diseases like lung cancer was really very inefficient. And what we had to do was to prevent the disease occurring. And uh, I discovered there was a position in Canada open for somebody like me. I applied, was accepted, and I set up the epidemiology unit of the National Cancer Institute of Canada which I directed for 15 years. And uh, I recruited a number of staff to work with me on statistics, on nutrition, um, and uh, interviewing patients and uh, normal people. And we did studies on diet and cancer, on occupational cancer, including uh, radiation, and uh, on uh, occupation and cancer. And then later, um, I was invited by the head of Ontario Hydro, the Crown Corporation in Ontario responsible for generating and transmitting electricity to do a study of their workforce. And we discovered that the workforce who went in and out of electric, particularly electrical fields in the course of their work uh, had increased risk of uh, um, leukemia and lymphoma, another form of blood cancer, and also probably um, uh, brain tumor. And I also did a study of uh, childhood leukemia in Toronto, uh, in which we were able to measure electric and magnetic fields in the home. Um, and we found that when the home was wired with the conductors kept separate, uh, there was quite a bit of uh, electrical and magnetic fields, particularly magnetic fields, released. And we found this was in- associated with increased risk of uh, uh, childhood leukemia. Uh, we have known for so some time. Not... Sorry. Mm-hmm. I was going to say oh, we have known for some time that radiation in the form of X rays of the pelvis of women uh, during pregnancy. Uh, increases the risk of leukemia in the child. So we knew in that respect that radiation was hazardous. And the studies we did of uranium miners and, uh, of course, the studies that were done of the uh, survivors of the atomic bomb explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki confirmed increased risk of cancer, which, in fact, increased during the lifetime of the individuals. We also have uh, considered uh, the potential hazards of radio frequency radiation released by um, cell phones and uh, towers 
and particularly this new proposed 5G. And we're very concerned that this will increase the risk of cancer. Our cell phones held close to the head increase the risk of brain tumor. And it's also clear that this sort of radiation can cause adverse effects on childhood development and also in terms of fertility in both men and women. In terms of Wait, nutrition... Question, uh... Yes. Well, quick question here. There's there's a lot to talk about. If if you don't mind, maybe we can start out with yes. you know radiation, both ionizing and electromagnetic. So I think it's much more easily accepted that ionizing radiation, you know, from nuclear sources, from CT scans, MRIs, etc., you know, can more direct, it can pretty directly lead to cancer if the exposure is high enough. But I think uh, something that's a lot more hidden or just not recognized is you know what is the radiation from all the electronics were surrounded by, by like you said, 5G, by cell phones, by, you know, AirPods, by the, all this stuff that we use, computers constantly. That seems to be a lot less talked about. And for some reason, there's a lot more resistance, it seems like, in the scientific community to accepting that those can cause, uh, you know, dysfunction in the body. What, what's your thought there? Do you see that, that that's the case? Or is there a, a pretty ready acceptance that our devices could be affecting us negatively? Well, I think there's increasing recognition that they can. Uh, we've just had, I and my colleagues have just had um, a paper published in the journal Frontiers of Public Health in which we've reviewed the evidence that radiofrequency radiation increases the risk of cancer. Epidemiology studies, particularly in Sweden and France, have shown the association of prolonged cell phone use with brain tumors and more recently, there has been there have been two major animal carcinogenicity studies, one conducted by the National Toxicology Program in the United States, a $20 million study, and another conducted by the Ramazzini Institute in Italy, which is generally regarded as prestigious. And both of them found that prolonged exposure to rats uh, will increase um, the sorts of cancers that we are seeing uh, in humans in relation to the use of radiofrequency radiation. So we now, I and my colleagues now uh, consider that radiofrequency radiation must be regarded as a class one human carcinogen. And that being so, a lot of things would have to change. In Canada, the so-called safety code six is not sufficient in preventing people uh, getting exposed um, and getting cancer as a result of this exposure to radiofrequency radiation. So I think the the um, certainly in my view and that of my colleagues I work with, uh, the evidence has become extremely strong that this is hazardous. So what, what does that mean? Does that mean that manufacturers, for instance, of cell phones need to change the shielding of their phones when used by people? Or does that mean that, uh, I mean, where would the, I don't know, how would you affect, I don't know if you could affect the behavior of how people use, for instance, cell phones, computers, but the devices themselves, it sounds like that's where the change would need to be. Well, I mean, there needs to be changes in the way people use cell phones. It's really particularly hazardous to use them right up against the head. They should be taken away from the head uh, and all these sorts of exposures. The further you are, are away from the source, the less the risk to you. And using wired um, connections to the um, to telephones uh, is, is far safer uh, and doesn't involve exposure to radio frequency radiation. Um, but uh, if you have to use cell phones, then you should preferably use uh, not the sort of earbuds that Apple have recently released, but um, special um, connectors which essentially use air as the uh, uh, conducting mechanism of sound um, to the ear. And this reduces your exposure substantially. So if I were to compare uh, AirPods, you know, the wireless Bluetooth headphones in terms of radiation exposure. Well, if I were to compare these four things, putting a phone to my head, 
and just speaking into it versus uh, using the AirPods, the Bluetooth wireless headphones versus using wired headphones versus using air gap headphones, you know, with a little plastic spacer. Would that well, air good. Gap is good. You know. uh, but uh, you probably should have tried to avoid Bluetooth because that involves the same exposure. Um, and uh, there are some special, um, which are produced uh, specially uh, by somebody in Israel, safe buds, um, which uh, do reduce exposure substantially. But as far as possible, people should use landlines, um, cut down their use of cell phones. If they have to use them, keep them away from the head. If they can get these um, air-filled uh, connectors, and that would be even better. Has there been any impetus by cell phone designers to modify the design of their phones? Is that even possible to reduce the uh, radi radiation effects? I haven't seen any evidence of that. Uh, as far as I can see, neither Samsung nor Apple have recognized this as a potential hazard. Um, a, uh, but uh, increasingly, people are recognizing this. One of the things which doesn't relate to cancer, but relates to people's health, is that increasingly it's recognized a number of people are actually sensitive to uh, this form of radiation, radio, non-ionizing radiation, and become quite sick if they're exposed to it. Um, the exposure could either be phones or uh, cell towers or smart meters. Uh, for smart meters, uh, you should, as far as possible, introduce shielding to protect yourself from the effects. What, um, what, why does this cause effects in, in, in life? Why does it affect animals and people? I haven't heard that talked about very much. Like, is it interfering with cell-to-cell -cell communication? I mean, what do you think is the mechanism by which these EMF fields are affecting people? Well, I, I'm not the sort of person to talk to about mechanisms. Um, uh, Dr. Martin Powell um, has done a lot of work on this. I think you should talk to him. Uh, he's found changes in uh, oxidation, uh, the way um, cells deal with uh, their normal metabolism, um, which appears to be uh, responsible for the ill effects that we're seeing. So what what is your role? Is it you know, it's calling attention to these problems, but what I, I mean, specifically because of your training, your long history, you know, your influence, what is your role? How do you want my to affect role change? Is I think to do my best to um, point out to people what the issues are. I've uh, uh, communicated several times with Health Canada. They've so far ignored me. I've con communicated with the Minister of Health. As I said just now, I've recently, with my colleagues, uh, published a paper on this, which we're hoping will get wide distribution. Um, whenever I'm asked to talk on this, I agree as far as I'm able. Um, there are uh, uh, symposia in uh, Montreal and Kingston in Ontario I'll be presenting to um, uh, in September on this issue experienced epidemiologist. I've lot of, done a lot of studies. I can assess studies, and uh, I think my contribution should be to point out the problems to the general public as far as I'm able to reach them. So what's, um, let's talk a little bit about 5G. Uh, how is that going to be different from our current networks, and what do you guess is going to be the effect on uh, you know living creatures and people if it gets well, implemented? 5G, which means fifth generation, also incorporates other forms of radio frequency generation emitting, 2G, 3G, 4G. Um, but the, the, the particular radiation in 5G is rather superficial. It uh, goes it's into the skin. It's been evaluated by um, the U.S. military for crowd control. It's already been demonstrated to um, cause uh, problems with plants and insects. And uh, we, un as it's being introduced, because it doesn't travel very far, it's being introduced on small uh, towers which are attached to 
you know, telephone towers and whatever in people's uh, neighborhood. And this is uh, going to bring exposure to them. And it wouldn't surprise me if once this happens, there'll be so much illness that the firms will have to withdraw it. Um, the, op the option, uh, preferable option to this is to use, get internet con connectivity through fiber optic cables um, because these are much faster. Uh, they uh, uh, do not involve exposing people to radio frequency radiation. I'm fortunate in that I live in an area where Bell Canada is providing television and internet and telephone services to my home by optical fiber. So uh, the risks in my family are much less. So the state of affairs is what? That 5G is coming. Uh, there's no push to stop it. And it's going to be here no matter what. Well, there are a number of organizations which are um, developing in a number of areas to try and point out to people, um, the authorities, that this is a bad thing and to oppose the introduction of 5G. My own feeling is that this, these will sometimes work, but when they don't, what will inevitably work will be the um, lawsuits that will follow the introduction of 5G um, when people get ill and sue the firms that have introduced this into their neighborhood. And one of the things we know is that uh, the uh, major insurance companies, Lloyd's in England, Aviva in North America, will not in insure companies against this sort of uh, potential uh, risk. So that uh, firms have got to have to be careful. If firms, uh, you know, seem to just be charging ahead, which is what it seems like to me, again, I'm not an industry insider, but it seems like they're just charging ahead. Perhaps uh, an intervention can be made at the insurance company level, where you speak to insurance companies, show them studies, et cetera, and tell them, hey, let carriers know we're not going to insure you and that we consider it too risky. Maybe that'll put a pause on uh, their plans to put in 5G. I don't know. Well, they've already done that. They've already done that. Okay. And those firms that have chosen to go ahead have presumably made some sort of calculation that they will earn much more and can take on the risks themselves. Um, I think they are very unwise, but uh, there's not much I can do about that. If people are prepared to act stupidly, they will. Well, as a, you know, a regular person living in a neighborhood, is there anything you can do to mitigate your exposure. I mean, I, I'm sure you, you could probably control the environment in your home far more than you could outside your home, and that's actually a public space. So, I mean, what, any recommendations for someone listening on what they can do? I think what they should be doing is to try and influence their local um, uh, metro, their, their local council uh, to act to prevent the introduction of this. Now, this sort of uh, action by people has, uh, I understand, be made, been made illegal in the United States, um, but that hasn't prevented uh, a number of organizations to try to do their best to prevent the introduction of uh, 5G. Well, switching a bit to uh, the nutrition side of things and how nutrition affects cancer, um, again, I've only heard of... Uh, oh, uh, random genetic mutation and we're going to give you uh, more medicine and chemo and radiation and surgery to, you know, to stop your cancer, which is what the science has been saying for 50 years. It's rare. I mean, I've heard from some people, which is good, but it's rare that I've heard anyone talk about diet even being a factor in any oh, condition. That's cancer. Surprising. So what's your, uh, yeah, it's, you know, what's your, uh, what are your, what's the background here? Well, the American Institute of Cancer Research, the World Cancer Research Fund, have been very active in trying to promote um, healthy diets to prevent cancer. Um, this has been going on for more than 20 years. Uh, my group was one of the first to do studies on uh, diet and cancer. We found increased risk um, by, uh, for colon cancer um, with uh, uh, red meat consumption, We've known for some time that uh, uh, stomach cancer 
uh, risk can be reduced by uh, a diet which is high in vitamin C. Um, increasingly, it's recognized that red meat consumption should be reduced to as, as much as possible and that what people should do is to substitute um, by, with fish and preferably plant-based diets, diets, which uh, is something that uh, um, we first started advocating more than 20 years ago. The other thing that uh, reduces uh, risk of cancer associated uh, with uh, nutrition in a way is exercise. Um, exercise uh, substantially reduces the risk of breast cancer, for example, and will reduce the effect of other cancers. So healthier nutrition, much less red meat, very little preserved meat, avoiding nitrate preserved meat, uh, fish, mm. plant-based diets, uh, these will reduce everybody's risk of a number of cancers. What about if someone uh, has been told that they have cancer? Can they make changes in their diet to affect their outcomes? You know, what's your belief that there? Help. What does evidence show? Is there evidence? There is some evidence, yes. We've done studies, uh, particularly on breast cancer, to show that um, the diet uh, post-diagnosis, uh, during and after treatment, uh, should be as healthy as possible because that will help to reduce recurrence or progression of cancer. So that a, it's not just the prevention cancer occurring, it's also after, uh, if cancer has occurred, that one should do one's best to consume a healthy diet. And people by and large know what a healthy diet is. We've been taught for years um, that we shouldn't have too much meat, particularly red meat, more plants, plant-based diet, um, and uh, vitamin C and other vitamins are uh, in, preferably in food. Uh, additives, by and large, are not needed if you eat healthily. How about engine um, red meat bad for you? Well, what if you consume a plant-based diet, but the, the plants you're eating you know, have plenty of pesticides in them and everything, but the meat you're eating is, uh, let's say, grass-fed and pasture-raised, and it doesn't have the hormones and antibiotics that maybe traditional meat would have. Would you say then that perhaps it would be okay to eat meat, or are you saying wholesale red meat bad no matter what? I would food? say it's a, it's a bad thing to eat uh, red meat. In terms of pesticides um, in plants, of course, we should try and encourage farmers to reduce as much as possible. But uh, the pesticides don't get into plants. They're on the surface of the plants. So one has to uh, uh, wash them thoroughly, uh, boil when you can, and uh, that will largely reduce uh, ill effects of pesticides. Mm. Any uh, thoughts on sugar? Sugar? In terms of well, health, yeah. If, if you take too much sugar, you'll tend to put on weight. So you should cut down the amount of sugar. Um, in your diet, uh, and uh, uh, if you insist on having sweet things, um, have uh, plant-based sweet things. Fructose, which is the sugar in plants, is much healthier than sucrose, which is uh, what we generally have if we add sugar to tea or coffee. Mm. Avoid that. Get used to not having sugar in your tea or coffee cut down the amount of sugar you add to various meals. Hmm. All right. Um, in terms of diet, have you seen any dietary interventions, you know, whether they're, you know, if you want to characterize them as extreme or not extreme, but that have, have affected cancer in a big way, you know, affected people that have cancer in order for them to, uh, you know, delay other therapies or to, you know, maybe go into remission? Have you seen any evidence of uh, diets that can really affect cancer in a big way? Well, we believe it. We believe it will, but I agree the evidence is not that strong, and uh, I personally have not done studies of that type. Have you seen any studies that are attempting to control for diet, regardless of whether they're studying cancer or not? I mean, I, I've seen. You know, it doesn't seem like there's. Uh, when I've spoken to researchers, and they talk about clinical trials and 
things like that, they all seem to, uh, to say like, oh, it's not possible to control for diet. Have you seen that anyone is doing such a thing or is it um, not really? Well, I agree it is rather difficult to control for diet, but um, um, the sort of experimental evidence you're suggesting we need um, is really not available. Um, it, it's just that the, the associations we've noted between um, when people eat poor dietary pattern and the occurrence of cancer, which have led us to promote a healthier diet as a means of preventing cancer. I mean, there are studies going on in the UK, in Canada, in the US um, about people who've taken healthier diets. They're being followed and uh, the evidence is increasing all the time that healthier diets reduce the risk of cancer. So what do you think is ahead for the, the near future, and maybe the further future? What, uh, what big sea changes do you see coming, if any? Well, I, I anticipate that uh, as we learn more about cancer and individuals' susceptibility, we will be able to um, be more specific in our advice to individuals. At the moment, the work on genetics and epigenetics largely relates to treatment. But I foresee this as, as the evidence gradually accumulates uh, that people will soon be in a position to have genetic tests which will tell them whether they're particularly susceptible to certain forms of cancer and then can be given uh, prescriptions to try and avoid it, including healthier diet, I anticipate, and uh, uh, better, more exercise. Okay, but you, you, I mean, do you see any big changes coming? You know, personalized medicine, the promise of that, well, genetic we're engineering, talking, you know, CRISPR Personalized testing, medicine at the moment relates to treatment, but I think this will shift. Right. And uh, um, as people discover the limitations, there are bound to be limitations of so called personalized medicine in terms of treatment. I think increasingly, the geneticists will shift to seeing how they can identify individual susceptibility and introduce uh, measures to reduce individual risk. Mm. Okay. Well, very good. Well, what's the best way for people to uh, see what you're doing, what you're working on, and maybe get in contact? To get in touch with me, you say? If, if, if you wish it, yeah, or at least to see your papers, your work. I mean, you prefer to be contacted through your website. Uh, do you prefer not to be contacted at all or through social media? You know, what, what are you comfortable with in terms of people that want to follow up and find out more? I'm comfortable with people contacting me. Um, if anyone who listens to this podcast wants to send me an email, um, I'd be happy to receive that. Uh, my email address is ab.miller at simpatico, S-Y-M-P-A-T-I-C-O dot C-A or ab.miller at utoronto dot C-A, which is simpler. And I'll respond to both because they both come to my computer here. Okay, excellent. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.